Today we're going to talk about why you should always, always store your data in arrays. Or was that vectors? Well, what is actually the difference between those two data structures in Rust? This is Green Tea Coding, my name is Max, and today we're going to look at the fundamentals of Rust, arrays versus vectors. So what is an array? An array is just a data structure in which you can store multiple elements of the same data type. So for example, if we want to have some numbers, which are the numbers from 1 to 5, we could just produce this array here, call it nums, and you can see you just need to open and close square brackets, and inside you get your five numbers. The data type for this is also denoted by square brackets, meaning this is an array. The elements contained are of type I32, and you have five of those numbers in there. Now let's say we decide that we don't really like the three in there anymore. So we could make this mutable and just say nums at index two, because we are zero indexed. So number one will be at index zero, therefore number three will be at index two. We can just change this to, let's say, an eight. And this will work perfectly fine. Let us just take a look at this array. Let's print it. And what I do here is I use the debug print statement, which is denoted by a colon and a question mark. And with this, you can print any arbitrary structure that implements the debug trait. But don't worry about that for now. If you want to print a vector, you can just do it like this. So cargo run. And we see we get one, two, eight, four, five just as we expected. However, now what happens if we wanted to add the number six to it? Well, this is not possible because an array lives on the stack. And as we learned in the video about ownership, everything that is on the stack needs to have a fixed size and this fixed size needs to be known at compile time. And this is why the type definition of this array includes the number of elements, therefore the size. So, what if we still want to have some data structure where we could add another number or even remove numbers if we wanted to? This is where the vector comes in. So we have a nums vector in this case, and this is gonna be denoted by the name vec with an uppercase V. And just like the string, we can do colon colon from and construct our vector from an array. So one, two, three, four, five, and this will work just fine. However, this time we can do something like numsvec.push and we can add the six at the end, which will work perfectly fine this time. Let's just take a look at it. Yeah, there it is. If we don't like the six anymore and we also don't like the five, we can just remove numbers from here. So numsvec.pop is what this method is called. And if we call that two times, each time it will remove the last number from our vector. And if we print it again, we should see that it's now just going from one to four. Perfect. If you ever wonder what the length of your vector is during runtime, there is a handy method that is called .len, which also exists on the array, of course. And this can give you the length during runtime. And of course, as we expected, length is equal to four here. Now, having all those numbers is great, but having nothing to do with it is really boring. So let's just write a function in which we sum all of those numbers up. We're gonna call it sum of numbers due to lack of creativity. And the input argument is gonna be numbers. And now what? Do we take an array or do we take a vector? I would actually like to have the same function do work for both the array and the vector, because it seems against all laws of software development to write this function twice only because the input slightly differs. Well, I will give you a resolution to this problem shortly, but for now, let's just start with a function for the array. What we will take in as input is a reference to an array containing i32 elements, and we will also return an i32, which is the sum. 
We don't need ownership here. We don't need mutability on the numbers. This is going to be perfectly fine. Then we're going to start out our sum with zero. So let mute sum equals zero. And even though I did not formally introduce loops yet, I think most of you should be comfortable with the concept of looping over a data structure that has multiple elements in it. And the syntax in Rust is really, really simple. We're going to use a range-based for loop here and just say for n in numbers, which is basically the same as saying, please go through all of the numbers and call the number that we're currently at n and store it in this variable n. And like this, we can do sum plus equals n in order to sum everything up and return the sum at the end. Let us see what our result is going to be. We are going to print line sum of array numbers is equal to, and we're just going to call this function right from this print line statement, sum of numbers of nums. And of course, we need the ampersand here. And the result is going to be 20, which seems about right for me because we put the 8 in there. So now back to our initial problem. How do we make this function work for vectors as well? Well, we could just try whether it works out of the box. Maybe Rust has some kind of surprise for us here. So sum of vector numbers. And this time we'll do nums vec. And lo and behold, there's no squiggly lines. There doesn't seem to be any error. Let's see what we get. Code is running perfectly. Result is correct. So how does that work? Is that some kind of dark magic that we used here? Or is it coincidence that only for this case it would work? None of both. This is where slices come in. So a slice is the option, if you have a data structure like an array or a vector, to only look at part of these numbers. So if we'll start with a slice over the array, the way we would define it is by a reference to nums. And now, instead of only giving one index, we'll give a whole range of indices. Let's say we'll start with one, and we want to go all the way up to three, and three is in this case excluded. So let's print this to see where we are here. And we can see this worked as expected. We got the number starting from index 1 up to index 3, but the number at index 3 is excluded. So we get 2 and the 8 that we replaced 3 with. The thing that is noteworthy here is the type, of course. It is a reference to an i32 array, just like the input type that we had to our function. No surprise. However, if we do the same thing for a vector, so we get a vec slice, and we'll do that in the exact same way. We we'll go from one to three. Just to mix things up, let's this time include number three, which you do just by putting this equal sign here. We can see that the type is exactly the same. So no matter what we are slicing, so to say, whether it is an array or it is a vector, we always get a view or a read-only reference to the contained data. And it doesn't matter anymore whether this was a vector or whether this was an array. And of course, we can also just print it here, our vector slice. And we will see the third index is now included. Perfect. So slicing is really, really handy. And you can see how quickly you can do this compared to something like C++, where you would have to mess around with iterators, this is really nice. So let's say you wanted to have everything starting from the zeroth element. You could, of course, put the zero here, but actually you don't need the zero at all. You can just start with your dot dot. If you want to have everything including the last element, you can just remove everything that is behind those two dots, and it will include all the elements. And actually, once you get to this syntax, so you want all the elements in there, you don't even need the brackets anymore. You can just remove them and you get a reference to a vector in this case, which will automatically convert or collapse into a reference to an array when needed. And this is exactly what happened here 
at our function call. Now before we leave coding for this part of the video, let me just give you a quick shorthand notation to instantiate vectors. Of course, you could do it with this vec colon colon from, but because this is a very often used operation, Rust has a macro to make this very, very quick. So you just type vec with a lowercase v this time, exclamation mark, you get rid of the parentheses, and you see we get exactly the same type, and this is a bit nicer to read. So let's take a look at how our data is stored by Rust. If we have an array, this is very simple. All of the data is stored on the stack because we know beforehand what the sizes that we require. And this also makes it very clear why you cannot change the size, i.e. push an additional element or delete an element. Everything on the stack has to have constant size that is already known at compile time. Let us now see it how Vector does this. Here we only have three elements on the stack, each of which has 64 bits. Number one, we have a pointer that points to some address on the heap. Here on the heap, we store our actual data, the same data that we had on the stack in the array, meaning our five 32-bit integer numbers. But additionally, we store on the stack that we have a length of five, which is important for us because we need to know what indices are still allowed data or still valid data for us and which are not. And beyond this, we have a capacity, which in this case is eight. I mean, it always has to be at least as big as the size. And this tells Rust, hey, in this vector, you can still store three additional elements. And if you want to store more than three additional elements, then we probably need to reallocate here. And you see, this is how vector gives you this flexibility of being able to push and pop elements during runtime. The data and some overhead is stored in the heap, whereas the controlling structure, meaning the pointer, a length and the capacity indicator are stored on the stack and are therefore always a constant size. And now let us of course address the elephant in the room, performance. Well, if your data structure is fully contained on the stack, which is the case with an array, this of course leaves you with the best performance you can have. Allocation and deallocation are really easy and cheap, so this is perfect. On the other hand, if you need a dynamically sized data structure, like the vector is, of course you will always pay the price of having to allocate and deallocate on the heap, which is way, way slower than it is on the stack. Therefore, always consider before using a vector whether you actually need the dynamically sized data structure or whether an array could do. Well, I'm sure that by now you can find out yourself when to use an array versus a vector and that this will help you on your way to becoming a better station and in your private projects. If this video helped you, then leave a like and a comment and consider subscribing. See you next time with Green Tea Coding.